start with uh, something I meant to mention last time, a bit of a guide about the reading. The subject matter for this week is kind of scattered in book over about three chapters in the book. Uh, just because the way they decided to progress through things is a little bit different from the way I decided to progress through things. Um, so, for example, it might make sense to go to chapter 11, read pages 367 to 369, uh, three in chapter 12, pages 381 to 395, which is the end of the part where they talk about measuring flow, and then chapter 14, more or less all of that. Um, I, maybe the, I hope that helps in the If you've been struggling with what to read, I'm sorry I didn't tell you that. Class. Class. Here we go. Any more quizzes? Okay. All right. I went pretty blisteringly, I suppose, maybe for some of you, through and flow mechanics stuff. So I want to stop at this point and take a little stock of what maybe we learned or what we want to take away from last time. Um, so what have we learned so far? Well, uh, we've talked about initiation of motion. And Most of, most or maybe even all of what I talked about was motivated by this question of when does something on the bed street bed, when does something on the bed of a stream move? Um, we came up with a relatively simple recipe that says if we calculate uh, shields number and particle Reynolds number and we find where that uh, X, Y pair or R, E, P, tau, star pair is on our modified shields diagram. Then we can say, well, okay, if uh, we, once we find it on there, we can see whether the point is above or below the curve. So if it's if it's below the curve, then that means our tau star is less than the critical tau star. And that's a no-go for motion. If we're above the curve, tau star is greater than the critical tau star, and that means we're likely to move. And I do say likely because nothing's all that certain when it comes to moving sediment. I mean, at least not, in, not at, at values of shear stress that produce shields numbers that are close to these values, right? I mean, if we're Obviously, if we increase the shear stress by a factor of 10 above this, then we're 
you know, we can be pretty sure something's going to move. But you know, in this threshold area, um, we got to be a little bit circumspect about whether something's going to move or not. So initiation of motion, we've got at least a recipe for getting at that. Um, we also learned that for uniform steady flow, well, we learned that there is a thing that we call uniform steady flow. Uniform steady flow is flow that is not changing or not so much in the long, in the long stream direction. So it's constant roughly with distance and it's not changing very quickly or it's near constant in time. And when that's the case, then we can calculate the shear stress as if it's just a hunk of material on an inclined plane. And that gives us a relatively simple formula for the shield's number, which amounts to the depth times the slope divided by the relative submerged specific gravity and the grain size. R was about 1.65 for quartz. Easy to write, easier for me to write that down than the whole friggin' relative submerged specific gravity <laughs> terminology. And of course diameter. Okay. We learned about the law of the wall. That is that we have a predictable relationship for turbulent flow, a relatively predictable relationship between velocity and height above the bed. In particular, that it follows a logarithmic type profile. And that means that we, well, I mean, so what does that do for us? It's actually pretty, a pretty powerful thing. It says that we can solve for the fraction of depth at which the local velocity equals the depth average velocity. Okay, so that's depth. at some height, and that's depth averaged. And it means in this case that the Z is about 0 0.4 times the total depth. Now, you might well ask, Really? Well, this thing here costs a mess of money and people are willing to spend it. This is based on the law of the wall. This is based on repeatedly finding that the average velocity for the depth is at four tenths of the total height above the bed, which is why these markings are four centimeters relative to that ten centimeters. So if I'm in a stream, I put my flow meter here, I set this on the bed, I measure the height on the side here, and then I've got numbers here and on the handle. I don't have to move this, I don't have to pick it up now to decide where to put this. I simply set this to the depth that I read on the weighting rod itself. 
what's called a top setting weighting rod, and it is based on the fact that the law of the wall tends to work. Otherwise, you wouldn't pay several hundred dollars, maybe even a thousand dollars or something like this. I know, a thousand bucks. I don't know. Actually, I haven't researched lately how much these things cost. They're not cheap. Um, they're awesome. Though. I mean, when I learned to do discharge, I didn't have a top setting waiting rod, so when I could first that one, this. <laughs> well, you know, they're relatively durable. <laughs> and the time I lean somebody's bass guitar up against an amp, it'll probably fell over. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, that's the law of the wall is why people will spend the money for these and the people who make them get that money. So, that's a thing. Um, Now, it is also worth pausing at this point to make sure that we get the right idea of what's going on when we're looking at a Shields diagram. Because once we do all this non-dimensionalizing, we've got to be careful that our intuition follows along with that. So, let me see how quickly I can pop. Up this stuff. <coughs> Why is it called the law of the wall? Some guy last name wall. Uh, it's because it's based on. I don't know why they don't call it the law of the bed. But it's based on the idea that the velocity, that you have a no-slip boundary condition. That is, at your wall, your velocity must be zero. And that the turbulent eddy viscosity increases linearly with distance away from that wall, at least near the wall. So it's, it's partly called the law of the wall because it's only valid near the wall. There's, I mean, there's a couple of reasons why they don't make waiting rods longer than this. One is it would, I mean, if the flow's any deeper than you can measure with this, you really ought not be standing in the water. But another is that the law of the wall doesn't really work once the flow gets deeper than this. Um, and that's because far away from the wall, the law no longer holds, because it's based on boundary layer theory or what have you. So, um, all right, so I wanted to quick, well, maybe, I don't know, maybe not so quick, but um, referring to the Shields diagram, um, This, remember what we're in general plotting over here. This is a non-dimensional shear stress. It's a shear stress that's divided in, by, among other things, divided by the particle diameter. So when I've got, when I, out here where I'm approaching a constant critical shields number uh, for initiation of motion, that corresponds on this graph to where I've got a linear increase in the necessary critical shear stress for motion as a function of grain diameter. Okay, so this is what it looks like in dimensional coordinates, right? Here are critical shear stress. This is not normalized, this is not dimensionless. This has units of Pascals even though there's no numbers up here. And this is grain diameter, which has units of length. And now there is something kind of odd going on down here. That is for stuff smaller than about 0.1 millimeters, it actually is harder to move it 
then it fits larger. But for stuff larger than 0.1 millimeters, yes, always your necessary, your critical shear stress is increasing with diameter. The larger the particle, the harder it is to move. Um, just want to say that and show you at least a schematic sort of graph that says that, because the shield's diagram can be a little bit unintuitive on some level. Um, now, you might ask, what's going on down here? And I will say, I'm not sure, because it's complicated. Uh, partly it has to do with things like whether there's some, there might, I mean, once you get uh, small enough, there can be, be cohesion among particles, so you can be messing around with, well, do the particles actually travel individually, or do they break off in flocks and clumps? Um, also, there's the, the issue of whether the grain diameter is large or small relative to the viscous sublayer thickness. If my particles are large enough, they stick up into that rough turbulent flow. If they're way smaller, then uh, they're not feeling that wind chill so much. What am I talking about, wind chill? Well, I've got kind of hairy arms. If I go outside and there's not much wind, I don't feel the cold because I've got a nice thick viscous sublayer. My hairs aren't sticking up into the wind. Wind starts blowing and that viscous sublayer shrinks way down and now my hairs are sticking up into that fast flow and I get cold. Um, similarly with grains, if they're big, they stick up into that flow. They're feeling all that you know, they're, they're sticking up into the higher velocity flow. If they're small, they're kind of sheltered below a viscous layer. Um, that's part of what's going on here. Um, but I'll leave it at that. Um, okay. Now, so we know a lot of stuff now. You guys are really amazingly knowledge about all this stuff that I zipped through last time. Okay. Vitiation of motion, uniform steady flow, law of the wall. Let's take a few minutes to consider what it gets us. In particular, I want to think about what we can do with this. I mean, I mentioned last time, right? Well, we either, we want to know things like, does a particle move given, a, given flow conditions? But we also might want to know, well, okay, I know this particle moved or it didn't move. What does that tell me about the flow condition? And once we've got a relatively simple formula like that, it's just begging for us to do just the minimal amount of algebra to figure some interesting things out, to answer some basic questions. So, let's let's go back to that. Now, um, our uniform steady flow Remember I said that our shield number is the depth times the slope divided by the relative submerged specific density, 1.65 typically, and the grain diameter. So, uh, and in particular we said, okay, if um, if I've got HS over RD greater than tau star critical, then that's my go condition. Now here's, here's the thing, a, a relatively important thing. Uh, this here is not algebra. We don't do algebra with this. Once we put a C on it, that is a, a value that we look up. We look it up off of a graph, 
or or it's simply a constant for large enough diameter. So on that shields diagram, we got this business, right? If we're up here and and we're at that constant value, uh, we're safe at say around a tenth of a meter, ten centimeter. That's a pretty big rock. Um, and that value is about 0.03. It's a pretty big rock, but if we're looking at like Missoula flood deposits or something like that, that aren't uh, silt like here in the Willamette Valley, but are actually, let's say, boulder bars like you find in some of the coolies in eastern Washington and in the Columbia Gorge. Um, then that you know using that constant value is a is a pretty good way to go. Um, but in general, again, it's it's a number that we look up, we consider it a constant, we don't break it down algebraically. That's a value. Okay. So given that it's a value, and we've got an equation for our criterion for motion. Then we can say, okay, well, what do I know and what do I want to find out? Um, so, for example, uh, given, say, depth, slope, and density, I can find the largest diameter that moves. Right, so again, I start with this basic go condition, right? And I solve that for diameter. Simple algebra. Doesn't mean I can screw it up in my notes. But luckily I caught myself in front of all these people. Um, now, what about, okay, it's one thing to know the flow depth. That can be pretty good. Um, you know, sometimes that's just plenty. Um, I may want to know 
I know discharge or I, I want to know discharge? Um, Well, I'm going to have to use uh, some kind of empirical relationship. Again, this is flow hydraulics. Uh, we can go with the super sophisticated computational fluid dynamics route, or we can go with something pretty simple that works a lot of the time. So, aka the, we can use what's known as the Manning equation, there are other options as well, but Manning is, is pretty handy. And it simply says that for uniform steady flow, my average flow velocity is related to the depth and the slope and a roughness parameter, which we typically call the Manning roughness or Manning N. And given that discharge, for example, equals velocity times depth times width, conservation of mass, right? Then I can plug this in and get discharge as a function of just depth and width. I'm not going to actually do that step because we don't need it right now, but that's what, what we can do. Now, in practice, Knowing the width is tricky, unless we've got a simple case, like a box culvert or a slot can. Right? If I've got vertical sides, then I don't need to worry about width changing with my depth and my discharge and so on. But for most streams, that's not true. For most streams, the banks slope and width changes with stage and therefore it's somewhat complicated. And we have to deal with that, and we deal with that typically also empirically. But that's the deal there. All right. Now that I've at least brought up the, the, uh, the issue of discharge as it relates to whether stuff is going to move or not. How often is a discharge big enough to move stuff? What do I mean by that? Well, if I've got, say, let's, let's say something close to home, something like the Willamette River or, the, or Oak Creek, a gravel bed stream, pretty common here in the West. How often does the gravel on that bed actually move? What kind of flow does it take to move it? And would you go swimming or tubing in that sort of flow? <laughs> so next time you're playing around in a gravel bed stream, stick your head underwater and listen. <laughs> Chances are you've done that, but you haven't listened because you've never heard anything except a motorboat or something like that, or your friends splashing around. If you could stick your water, head underwater and hear gravel clattering along, you probably didn't want to be in that water in the first place. <laughs> because you can hear it. I mean, you know, and, and uh, you know, like on a steep Alaskan stream, like I showed you a, a picture of last time, 
you can feel it in your butt if you're sitting on the banks. Because boulders, you know, rolling down a stream bed make a fair bit of noise and vibrations and so on. That's why people can actually use geophones, you know, seismic techniques. Uh, that's like a thing. People are using seismic techniques, <coughs> seismology, to try to measure sediment transport. Um, now, again, how often is discharge big enough to move, say, the median or grain size, like the 50th percentile grain size on the stream bed? Um, well, on average, for a relatively large, da large data set, the Shields number, tau star, is about 0.05 for bank full flow. That is the flow that fills the banks up to the top but doesn't flood over the flood plain. 0.05, is that big? Not really. Remember we said 0.03 is sort of that asymptotic value where we might have something moving. 0.05 is really uh, pretty, pretty borderline. Um, let's look at what that actually looks like with respect to some real data. Uh, again, it's got Oak Creek data and the Hollyatier data, some flume stuff, I think. I'm not sure, actually. Um, here's our tau star 0.05 right here. So that roughly corresponds, well, all of the Oak Creek data are values smaller than that. Um, but it does appear to be about where this curve, if we want to draw a curve through all those data, about where that rollover is. So for at about a tau star 0.05, that's about where we're getting general motion of particles on the bed. Below that, maybe some motion, but not a lot. What's that mean? Well, in your labs this week, you encountered a new term that I've been informed that some of you might have not encountered before and might have been a little unclear as to what it meant, called the formative discharge. And it was just kind of thrown out there with, uh, well, you know, of course that makes sense. It's kind of, a, don't you know what that is? Well, maybe not quite, but. What is formative discharge? Well, there's a number of different things that go by the, similar, by the same or similar name. Or, that is, there's a bunch of different names for the similar thing. The formative discharge is also known as, say, channel forming. Or effective. And typically about the same as bank full discharge. So it does appear to be that the flow that about fills up the channel banks to the top, with the caveat that if I've got a slot canyon, that you know, all bets are kind of off, right? If I've got a deeply incised sort of canyoning kind of channel. But if I've got a self-formed channel, um, that is, it's not deeply incised. The top of the bank is sort of where the floodplain starts. Um, then the flow that fills that up is formative, channel forming, effective. It is the discharge that appears, according to various calculations, to be the, the sort of part of the spectrum of flows that moves the greatest amount of stuff over time. So whereas Huge flows move a lot of stuff. They don't happen very often enough to be the most effective discharge. Small flows happen all the time, but they don't move anything or barely anything. And it's this intermediate sort of channel forming discharge that if we were going to use one value of discharge, 
to try to say, well, what is responsible for, say, the form of the stream in terms of both its cross-sectional shape and its longitudinal profile, that's the one we use. Typically, it is about this, it is similar to about the annual maximum flow with a one and a half year recurrence interval, which is another way of saying um, chances are about two thirds per year that the annual, that the maximum flow that year is going to be that big. I think I got that. Um, which means it doesn't necessarily happen every year, but it may happen more than once a year. In my experience, for example, at Oak Creek, um, it's probably, you know, as we get to smaller streams, more mi like mountain streams, those flows tend to happen less often. We might be talking a five year recurrence interval. Because in my experience at Oak Creek, I can go years taking students out there and the gravel bars don't change, and then one year they do. And then it's several more years, maybe, before things change appreciably. So that's what we mean when we're talking about a f the formative discharge. Again, also sometimes referred to as the effective discharge, um, and typically used when we're trying to do some math to figure out the form of the stream. Um, Is it always the same as bank full and so on? Maybe. I mean, no, not really always. Um, nothing's always, unless well, some things are always true, but that's not exactly one of them. Um, now, if initiation of motion is complicated enough, sort of, then so is transport rate. You know, I talked about the effective discharge being what moves sort of over time moves the most stuff. Um, same way we use an empirical relationship to get initiation of motion, we use empirical formulas to get transport rates, such as the one that you were introduced to in your lab, uh, known as the england hansen total <coughs> load equation, uh, which gives you sediment discharge as a function of discharge, slope, grain size, roughness, width, gravity. Um, and if you're wondering where it comes from, mainly it just comes from that's the function they were able to fit to the data. Um, probably also used something like a Manning equation in there somewhere, this in there somewhere. Uh, which is why you've got the discharge and slope to weird expo exponent values and so on. Um, and then what they do in the lab is they say, okay, if I've got a function that includes a function of slope, then I can solve for slope just like we did with glaciers. Except it's not as simple as with glaciers because you know, for this alluvial fan, there's all these different things to think about. Um, but conceptually, one of the handy kind of ways to whittle down into a nice visual of all this stuff that's going on with transport is this which is called the lane diagram. Okay, so I've got a balance, or the lane balance, actually. Um, and what it's telling me is, okay, if I've got a certain amount of stuff of a certain size, then it takes a certain amount of water at a certain stream slope to move that stuff. So, if I take, say, the same amount of stuff and make it coarser, that's going to tip the balance. I would have, if I had the same amount of water, I'd have to move this out to steeper streams. Similarly, if I've got the same amount of the same size stuff and I simply increase the size of the pile here, then that's going to weigh this down. 
I can either add more water, I can steepen the slope. Either one of those things will tend to accomplish the task. What do I mean, accomplish the task? Well, say I've got a bunch of stuff and a small slope, too small to carry it all at that discharge, what's going to happen to the stuff? It's going to pile up. <clears throat> and what's a pile? It's something that gets steeper as we pile on. So that slope will steepen itself. If we can't carry it, we'll drop stuff out and that'll steepen the slope of the stream. So this, the whole system is kind of self-adjusting. That said, again, we've got the whole spectrum of flows. I mean, well, you know, discharge isn't constant in time. Um, flows that move an appreciable amount of stuff may not occur very often. But in general, we can make this kind of thing work at least conceptually. And so, like I said, if, if, if I pile on here and that weighs us down, the needle tips this way and tells us we would be aggregational, we would be depositing stuff. Similarly, if I pile on water or increase the slope, then it tips the balance this way, tips the needle towards degradation, erosion of the bed in general. Um, now, how many of you came up with already just really awesome profiles in your lab? So that you're totally psyched about your new solution? A couple, maybe two, sort of, some half-hearted. Okay. Um, I've got a long list of things and I've got seven minutes. Um, so let me see what kind of advice I can drop for you in that time. Um, my general strategy is to reduce the number of degrees of freedom to the problem. If you go try and end in manipulating cell-by-cell -cell values in that model, there's an infinite, effectively infinite combination of things you could try. It's a hopeless situation. So you want to make the number of things you're actually trying to fiddle around with as small as possible. Um, the other thing you, want, you need to do is use multiple constraints, not just the shape of the profile. In fact, the shape of the profile is like the last thing you check. Because you need to make sure that, like, discharge doesn't go negative, the grain size doesn't go negative, that, se that, that sediment transport rate doesn't go negative, right? You need to, I mean, first of all, have a, a set of values that are at least possible before you even check to see whether you're getting something like the right shape of the profile. So that's in general. Um, in a little more detail, Take the things that you can set and forget and do that, like roughness. Set it and forget it. Use the given visual estimates uh, given in the, in the lab and interpolate linearly between those values at the various sites. Set it, forget it. Um, output caliber. Um, follow the advice given in the lab. Use those given values, interpolate, reduce by some factor. 0 0.6 seems to work well. And I think that's actually suggested. Channel width. Use a width coefficient. I said, gosh, channel width is a bit of an issue. Um, we use something empirical. The thing we almost always use is that width varies with the square root of the discharge. Given um, values that are given to you, uh, you can come up with a value for C, I believe it ends up being 0.5. 
it, it's a set and forget thing. Okay. So I've got a known width and a known discharge. I can solve for C. Set it and forget it. Um, input caliber. This is the really fiddly one. But this, the lab says less than 300 millimeters. So don't by any means make it bigger than 300 millimeters. I might, you might start with 200. Turns out you're going to have to about get right in between those two values. So um, let's say start with 200 or so and then fiddle with it later. Um, discharge input, flow accumulation in the canyon. Um, it's set up in, in, the, in the spreadsheet like you're going to have some constant amount per station or so on. Whatever you got to do to make it about, say, 3.75 cubic meters per second or maybe 3.6 cubic meters per second at the mouth of the canyon, go with that. And then, in general, sort of prefer a somewhat smaller value. Check back later with that. Um, discharge output. This is the water that's seeping into the fan. Now, this is one that, if you're not careful, can go negative. So, make, do, use, a, use something that cannot go negative. Subtract a fraction with, per distance. Make it an exponential decline in, in discharge. I would go with about 17% per kilometer. That's e to the minus 7.17x. Um, it won't go negative that way, which is awesome. Um, bed load input. That's the load that's accumulating in the canyon. Use a constant value. The lab says between 0.1 or, you know, between 1 times 10 to the minus 4 and 1 times 10 to the minus 3 cubic meters per second or something like that. You know, say start with 10 to the minus 3 and maybe adjust downwards, fill with that later. Bed load output, the load loss to fan deposition. Again, you expect a smooth decline, something that cannot go negative. Use something, again, like an exponential. Um, let's say, you know, use do your sort of um, I'm thinking like a similar factor is discharge, like a 0.17 times distance, but to a maybe distance to a power, like uh, say something less than one, 0.7, half that. Um, in either case, it won't go negative. On you. So again, you, you're looking for real ballpark stuff. If, you know, what are the you know, exponential decay type stuff assures me that nothing goes completely nuts up um, in those terms. Uh, and then fiddle with your input diameter, your input discharge, your input sediment discharge, and your output fractions to keep your average caliber reasonable. Ultimately, you want it between zero and the output diameter. So your, your average diameter should be smaller than what's depositing out, because it's, it, the course's stuff is depositing out first. And it should be greater than zero. Uh, and it's actually pretty fiddly there. Once you get down to it, like changing that input diameter by a millimeter here and there uh, can be the difference between going out of bounds or not. So that, that alone, fiddling with that, can get you pretty close. And then, you know, then you look at the, once you've finally got things that aren't going completely haywire and leading to impossible values, then check your goodness of fit. Then see, like, okay, how does it look? Um, and then you can start, okay, well, maybe I need to change that by a factor, you know, half that one or double that one or something like that. So um, I hope that helps. Um, if you obviously if you want to ask me questions about it, 
and I'm happy to answer them. The other thing I'll say is I have to confess that I, once I did the sort of basic rules that I'm telling you, I went ahead and fiddled with it for hours more than that to see how much better I could get it, and I really couldn't get it much better than that. So is it worth spending all those hours? F no, yeah. right? So uh, <laughs> make it easy if you can. Um, good luck with those. Again, come see me if you uh, want some more specific advice. Thank you.